Starship Flight 5 is on the horizon, and SpaceX is gearing up for Booster 12 static fire testing. The launch mount received major upgrades to iron out Flight 4 engine startup issues, and launch tower repairs continue. Tower 2 stacking and the second launch pad and associated flame trench construction have commenced. Meanwhile, Starship 31 successfully completed its cryoproof testing, fixing the issues that led to an anomaly during a similar testing in May. Join us as we delve into these latest developments and much more. In the thrilling aftermath of Starship Flight 4's success, SpaceX is forging ahead with groundbreaking preparations for Flight 5. Work is progressing on Starship 30, with the installation of the upgraded thermal protection system tiles taking place inside the high bay. Notably, the nose cone and some other regions of the ship lack the new secondary ablative heat shield material under the tiles. It looks like the material will not be installed under every tile, instead, they will only be applied in regions that experience maximum heating and stress during the re-entry phase. In addition to addressing tile durability, SpaceX is concentrating on reinforcing the flap areas and sealing hinge gaps to prevent flap destruction during extreme re-entry conditions. They have also replaced a Raptor vacuum engine on the ship, necessitating a static fire test before the launch. Super Heavy Booster 12, which will propel Ship 30 into space, is currently inside the Mega Bay undergoing preparations for Flight 5. Having completed its cryogenic proof testing, this booster is poised to undertake a full 33-engine static fire test on the launch mount. Meanwhile, the launch mount has recently been upgraded to prevent the booster engine startup issue that was observed during IFT-4. During Flight 4, one of the outer 20 engines of the booster failed to start up at the time of liftoff. The engine failure did not affect the vehicle's ascent as the other 32 engines of the booster throttled up and gimballed to compensate for the engine loss. But if multiple engines had failed during liftoff, the situation would have been different. Post Flight 4, Elon Musk said that the engine failed to ignite due to issues encountered during the startup sequence. So there was one engine that, that, that uh, didn't, didn't light, or, or mm -hmm. that we, it, it didn't explode, but that, that, that we thought was, we, we should not turn on. It, basically, it, 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 I think it aborted during the start sequence um, out of concern, mm -hmm. but 32 engines is fine. It's, yeah. it's, it's resilient to multiple engines being lost uh, and still uh, completing its mission. The orbital launch mount features 20 quick disconnect mechanisms designed to supply high-pressure gaseous methane and oxygen to the pre-burners of the booster's outer 20 engines, initiating the spin-up of their turbo pumps for startup. If one of these were to fail, then the engine they're attached to would not start up properly and would likely shut down. The engine failure in Flight 4 was likely due to a malfunction in one of these mechanisms. After Flight 4, teams worked on those quick disconnects for several days, and now, it looks like the issues have been addressed. Over the past week, the mechanisms have undergone at least 12 tests, with gases flowing through the system to ensure the propellant delivery pipes, valves, and associated systems function correctly. With the quick disconnect mechanisms now confirmed to be operating as designed, SpaceX can move towards the static fire test of Booster 12. The recently released road closure notice indicates that the static fire test might take place as early as July 9. A successful static fire test will pave the way for a wet dress rehearsal, culminating in the anticipated Flight 5 liftoff, currently targeted for late July. Starship Flight 5 will mark SpaceX's inaugural attempt to catch the Super Heavy booster using launch tower arms. If the booster fails to target the tower or encounters issues that prevent a tower catch, SpaceX will redirect it for an ocean landing. The catch practice tests conducted on June 25 and 26 with the test tank B14.1 were the first step towards preparing the tower arms for the actual booster catch. Only the performance of the left arm was verified during that test. More comprehensive practice tests, including both tower arms, can be expected in the coming weeks. A successful booster catch demands swift and precise arm and carriage movements along the tower's length. Future practice tests may also incorporate tests of coordinated arm and carriage motions. Just like all the previous integrated flight tests, the Starship Quick Disconnect mechanism encountered minor damage during the Flight 4 liftoff. Last week, teams lifted the Quick Disconnect mechanism from the QD arm and made necessary fixes to the system, including the replacement of one of the damaged hoses that delivers propellant to the Starship upper stage. The repair work is expected to continue in the coming days. Looking ahead, optimizing the QD arm retraction speed or implementing additional shielding appears crucial to preventing similar damages during upcoming flight tests. What do you think? Share your thoughts with me in the comments below. The construction of the second Starship launch pad and tower is progressing rapidly at the launch site. Following the assembly of the base structure and concrete filling, 
The teams installed the first pieces of the propellant delivery pipes into the tower base. They then finished the remaining floor section works, including setting up one of the elevator cabs. On Wednesday morning, the first tower section was transported from the Sanchez site to the launch site. The section already has the propellant delivery pipes, electrical conduits, and all other associated systems pre-installed. The tower section is currently being prepared for lifting and stacking. We can expect the first section to be stacked atop the base structure in the coming days. The remaining sections of the tower are currently being prepared at the Sanchez site ahead of their rollout to the launch site. The pre-installation of tower equipment will streamline the stacking process and expedite the tower's commissioning. Meanwhile, the barge carrying the final two sections of the tower, along with the tower arms and carriage that left Kennedy Space Center on June 6, has now arrived at the port of Brownsville. These parts and tower sections will soon be transported to Starbase. As per Elon Musk, Starship Tower 2 will feature a flame drench rather than a water deluge system as in the case with Tower 1. Well, the, is there any kind of redesign of the OLM and the, the, the booster of a day and all the all the uh, the flame trench and stuff like that? Is yeah, that's, it's a total redesign, which I don't know if we should do a total redesign, but the guys really want to do it, so I was like, okay. Like it'll have like more of a flame trench this yeah. time? Yeah. Compared to the deluge system, the flame trench efficiently directs the exhaust gases away from the rocket and launch pad and offers several potential advantages for managing the intense forces and heat generated during Starship launches. The trench is expected to reduce or eliminate damage to the launch pad and surrounding areas, as well as minimize acoustic energy during engine ignition and structural vibrations experienced by both the launch pad and the rocket. Additionally, the flame trench may require less maintenance over time compared to water deluge systems, which need regular inspection and upkeep of water supply systems, nozzles, and associated plumbing. This image shared by RGV Aerial Photography showcases ongoing work south of Tower 2, most likely for the construction of the launch mount and flame trench. We will have to wait a couple more weeks to confirm this. On early Monday morning, Starship 31, slated for the sixth integrated flight test, was moved to the Massey's site for testing. The ship previously underwent cryogenic proof testing at Massey's in May, however, during the detanking operations, a sustained flash of light erupted from the ship outside the oxygen tank section, just below the methane tank. It was later determined that the spark resulted from an electrical malfunction within the raceway, carrying electrical wiring along the exterior of the ship. Potential reasons for the spark and fire include short circuits, faulty insulation, or improper electrical connections. Ship 31 was then brought back to the production site for a comprehensive investigation. After the issues had been identified and fixes were made, Ship 31 returned to Massey's and successfully completed two rounds of cryogenic proof testing. Just like any cryo-proof test, both the methane and oxygen tanks of the ship were filled to capacity with liquid nitrogen, and meanwhile, six hydraulic rams on the test stand applied force to the aft section of the ship, simulating the thrust of six Raptor engines. This test not only confirmed plumbing reliability, but also provided crucial data on the ship's structural integrity under flight stresses. Either more cryo-testing will happen in the coming days, or if the engineers determine that they have enough data already, Ship 31 will be transported back to the production site for engine installation. Engine installation will be followed by static fire testing at the new test stand at Massey's. At the launch site, teams completed the removal of the last two remaining vertical storage tanks. The scrapping of the eighth and final tank on July 1 signifies the complete decommissioning of the old vertical propellant storage tanks, marking the conclusion of a long-standing era in propellant storage at the launch site and the transition to the new horizontal tanks. Concurrently, efforts are underway to expand the capacity of the new tank farm, which includes the arrival and deployment of additional horizontal tanks. The recently delivered tank is currently being positioned alongside the existing horizontal tanks, with more tanks scheduled to arrive in the near future. SpaceX intends to utilize the expanded tank farm to store and distribute propellants required for operations at both launch pads. Now, let's discuss some of the latest updates from the world of science and technology. In a recent incident, the Tianlong-3 rocket, developed by Space Pioneer, encountered a severe anomaly during a static fire test. The Tianlong-3 is a 71-meter-long two-stage rocket, powered by 9th-12 engines which utilize kerosene and liquid oxygen as propellants. Each TH-12 engine provides 1,090 kilonewtons of thrust at sea level and 1,350 kilonewtons in the vacuum of space. Tianlong-3 is intended for reusability, featuring grid fins and landing legs to facilitate a controlled vertical landing like SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket. 
On June 30, the rocket's first stage booster underwent a static test at the company's comprehensive test center in Ganji City, Henan Province. Initially designed to be a stationary test, the rocket unintentionally launched due to what appeared to be a failure in the mechanism securing it to the test stand. The rocket ascended briefly under its own engine power, soon followed by a series of engine malfunctions that resulted in the emission of black smoke and the engines shutting down. Observations indicated debris and engine pulsations before complete failure, hinting at structural damage possibly caused by the unintended liftoff. Eventually, the rocket, still carrying a significant amount of fuel, fell back to Earth and crashed into the mountains, culminating in a catastrophic explosion. Space Pioneer issued a statement after the incident, explaining that while the first stage of the rocket ignited as planned, a structural failure at the connection between the rocket body and the test bench occurred shortly thereafter, leading to the anomaly. Reports indicate that the test pad was designed to withstand only up to 600 tons of force, but the engines produced a thrust of 820 tons during the test. This disparity in thrust capacity likely contributed to the structural failure and the ensuing anomaly. Footage shared online shows that the test took place near a populated area, and it is fortunate that the rocket did not crash in that vicinity. The company reported that the rocket's onboard computer automatically shut down the engines after it lost control, and the rocket body disintegrated and fell within a safe area in the deep mountains 1.5 kilometers southwest of the test platform. Although the incident caused a local fire, no casualties were reported as the area had been evacuated in advance of the test. This anomaly exposes potential deficiencies in the clamping mechanisms used to secure the rocket to the test stand, emphasizing the need for comprehensive validation of ground support systems and highlighting the critical importance of stringent testing protocols. The incident is a significant setback for Space Pioneer, a leading company in the commercial rocket sphere that specializes in liquid propellant rockets. In April last year, Space Pioneer successfully launched its Tianlong-2 rocket, becoming China's first commercial launch operator to send a liquid carrier rocket into space and achieve orbit. The inaugural flight of the Tianlong-3 rocket, the larger and more ambitious successor to the Tianlong-2, was scheduled for September. It remains uncertain how the recent anomaly will impact this timeline. Space Pioneer has announced plans to analyze the anomaly thoroughly and to resume testing with new hardware as soon as feasible. NASA has awarded SpaceX a contract worth up to $843 million to develop the U.S. deorbit vehicle that will safely deorbit the International Space Station at the end of its operational life in 2030. The deorbit vehicle's mission involves docking with the ISS and executing the final maneuvers required for a controlled re-entry of the station into a remote ocean region, such as the South Pacific. Both the ISS and the deorbit vehicle are expected to break apart destructively during this re-entry process. Although SpaceX will handle the development of the deorbit vehicle, NASA will assume ownership once the vehicle is completed and will oversee its mission operations. Currently, there are no public details about SpaceX's design plan for the deorbit vehicle. The company might adapt its existing Dragon spacecraft or Starship vehicle for this purpose or develop a new custom-built craft from scratch. Operational since 1998, the ISS serves as a unique scientific platform where astronauts perform experiments across multiple research disciplines. However, the station's aging infrastructure and escalating maintenance costs present growing challenges for continued operation. Moreover, NASA currently aims to redirect its resources towards deep space exploration, including missions to the Moon and Mars. The agency also supports the creation of commercially owned and operated space stations in low Earth orbit, which will eventually take over the research and operational roles currently filled by the ISS. Rather than allowing the ISS to naturally decay and re-enter the atmosphere in an uncontrolled manner, NASA is committed to a safe and responsible deorbiting process. This deorbit initiative will involve collaborative efforts from the five space agencies that have been part of the ISS since its inception in 1998. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.